Okay, here we are again. That's great. We're carrying on our exploration and the big questions. Um, in a sense, uh, death is the biggest question. It is the big question. It's the great question. It's a question that gives me. Um, so it's really wonderful that Vidi Mon is going to be talking about this evening. Before I introduce tonight, I just there's a few usual little or uh, worky things. Um, so just to say tomorrow evening we'll be in the lecture hall, which is where you registered, because we're going to watch the first of the two Ian McGilchrist interviews. We'll be watching one tomorrow at eight o'clock, same time uh, that our host called uh, Buddha, uh, Beauty, Truth and Purpose, I think. And then the following evening, again, we'll meet in there at eight o'clock and we'll uh, watch an, in, an interview with Jan of Archer on um, the sense of the divine. So that's the two next two evenings. So we'll be exploring. Um, little um, other things to say. So a few people, so could, could they buy a copy of um, the Nature of Mind book? So um, we'd forgotten, I'm afraid, to put them in the bookshop. So do, and is, is, you can you know, buy one for a friend to give on when you get home as a kind of starter of the nature of mind it's, it's a, a wonderful text you know you, you just just from reading that you see that of Dante Sangaracha's vision of Buddhism and of the nature of mind but yeah there, there's bookshop there also Vidya Mahler's book is on sale in the bookshop she's written a, a very important book about uh, working with pain, uh, very, very valuable. Uh, my book is in there, and so is Sibadramati's bookshop. No, book, in the bookshop. Um, <laughs> Sibadramati hasn't got a bookshop, she's got, just got a book at the moment. <laughs> sure, there'll be a bookshop eventually called the Sibadramati bookshop. Um, and yeah, one other little, um, little kind of worky thing is, um, for breakfast service, can you just check with um, the team before you clock off. Um, <laughs> that's not quite a nice way of putting it, is it? But anyway, you know what I mean. So before you go and have breakfast, just check with the, the team. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I've got going a nod. Just so we make sure that everything's been done. Yeah, uh, that's not another little note I've been given. Okay, so tonight we're going to, well, I'm going to I was going to say we're going to explore the great question of death. But of course, that exploration in all of our lives probably started many many years ago i was just remembering um i've got my life two children um my partner's children and the oldest alex when she was about i think she was about six i was out with her and um she suddenly turned to me and she said Bandu, have you got a daddy said, no. no no i haven't i haven't got a daddy and she said is he dead Mark <laughs> um all very matter of fact and I was really struck because I didn't even know at that time that she had the word dead she said is she dead is he dead I said he is yeah he is dead yeah and she said what happens when you die I thought here we go <laughs> <laughs> I should be prepared for this <laughs> I said what happens when you die I said well nobody really knows but what I think happens is you see a great big white light and uh, you kind of walk into that light and everything feels sort of liberated. She said, yes, but what happens before that? <laughs> As if everybody knew about the white light thing. <laughs> that was all perfectly straightforward, but what happens before that? Um, I, knew, I felt like I said, well, there's life before that. <laughs> You're at six at the moment. Um, it wasn't long after her famous question when she said, Matthew Andrew, have you got a hairband? <laughs> I said, uh, no, just, I've got a hairband. <laughs> and I thought that so much of human life really is us going around saying, I've got a hairband. <laughs> um, you know, we so, so need to be important. Don't we? Um, really, we should have that sort of um, benign sort of compassion to someone asking you if you've got a hairband. But it also reminded me of my first, you know, thinking of her at that age. And it, I was very struck that she said, what happens when you die? You know, and have you got a daddy? Is he dead? Um, what happens? 
I remember a little bit later she went to her funeral and I said to her, what was it like? She said it was fine, except for there were so many dead people there. <laughs> <laughs> I said, so many dead people? And she meant the graveyard. Of course. What a wonderful way of putting it. Though. It was fine, except for there were so many dead people there. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was, that reminded me of, of me about that age. Um, when my grandmother died, uh, we were sharing our life stories on the... Um, on the team retreat and I was about that age when my grandmother died and my my parents somewhat surprisingly took my brother and I over to see her. I was very close to my grandmother she was I, I was her favorite um which basically just meant that I just went around and spent all the time in her, in her house doing colorings and talking I used to talk a lot um I mean I don't now <laughs> that's all done with you know, I don't do that um you know I'm very quiet now um <laughs> Uh, so she thought I was charming, but I remember we, we went to see her, my brother and I, I was very, really very young. Um, my brother remembers it as well, and she was on her coffin on her bed, and um, my father or my mother said, she's asleep, and I thought, she's not asleep. <laughs> you know, I've seen my grandmother asleep, I'd often go around and she'd be asleep, she doesn't look remotely like that, you know. I remember thinking, no, no, she is definitely not asleep, that is not asleep. And then um, my mom said, or my father said, oh, she's gone to a better place. I remember thinking, I don't know whether that's true either. I really don't know. And it was, a, for me, that I can almost, I, I feel, I don't know if this is true, but I feel that the reason I'm here now is as much to do with that moment as any. Even at that age, I remember, you know, I was very close to my grandmother, but it wasn't just about her that was a particular, it's a fact of death and I remember thinking this is a massive problem we've got here you know little six-year-old me with big ears um my ears were the same size but my head was much smaller <laughs> um, <laughs> um I remember really thinking this is a massive problem this is like of course I didn't have word those sort of words but I remember thinking this is about as problematic as it could possibly be and I also understood immediately directly that my parents didn't understand. You know, at that age, you get, you have this sort of belief that your parents know, and they say, oh, that's just that, and that's just this. And, and I could see that they didn't understand it. So that made it a double problem. I've got the, the reality of death, which seemed to me like a kind of universal question mark over everything about life. And then I could see that my parents didn't know uh, what happened. Yeah. And we're all in that position. We don't know uh, what happens when you die. We, we've really got a, a belief disguised as a fact. Um, so tonight, Vidyamala is going to start opening up this whole question of death, the whole mystery of death, and how that makes a mystery of our life. So Vidyamala. Good, thank you. Thanks, my chair Bandu. And hello, everybody at home. Lovely to be with you, lovely to be with you. Can you hear me at the back? And let me know if you can't at any point, just put your hand up, yeah. So I've been given this title. Do we really know what death is? And I said this to well, a friend, actually had seen this on Instagram, promoting this retreat. And she said, well, that's going to be a very short talk. <laughs> <laughs> no. But I've got a subtitle, which is Dying to Live. Dying to Live. And I'm going to cover a few areas. I'll go a little bit into um, the nature of my project so far and what's been covered around this topic. Um, a little bit into... In a, in a way, I think the mystery of death equally points to the mystery of life. And in a way, that's perhaps more relevant in a funny kind of way to us here. What does it mean to be alive, let alone what does it mean to be dead? 
go into that, uh, go a little bit into um, the whole Buddhist view on all that and teachings of the Bardos, say a little bit more about that. Um, a little bit about the, the whole Buddhist principle very simply is that we're training our awareness now all the time. That's the kind of task so that when we do encounter death, our awareness can meet that with clarity and so on. So I, I want to go a little bit into, you know, that's a big ask and life can be really hard sometimes. So well, how do we apply that teaching to um, life when it's hard? Say a bit about that. And then I'm going to go into, um, you know, some of the ways that Buddhism describes the mystery of the mind, the, the, the sort of free mind and uh, love, place of love. Yeah, so I'm going to, get, that's the kind of arc of the talk. <laughs> See how I get on with that? The, the scrappy mind map. <clears throat> so I think, you know, in all seriousness, do we really know what death is? Well, I think the answer probably is no, you know, in terms of we don't know it in, in you know, like we, well, I was about to say like we know something else, but perhaps we don't actually know anything. <laughs> Maybe that's accurate, but we might think, you know, that the sun sets in the evening and rises in the morning. That's something that we can kind of all agree on. But I think death really is a tremendous mystery. One of the greatest mysteries. But we have very strong hints about what death might be like. And the Nature of Mind project so far has explored this really, really well, I think. Um, I'm not going to go over everything that's been in the videos because you can watch those. Those of you who haven't seen them already, you can watch those on YouTube. And they're really, really good. Very, very interesting. So there's an interview with Penny Satori, who's a researcher into near-death experiences. And then there's a seminar between Maitreya Bandhu and Jnanavacha, sort of drawing out the Buddhist implications of that. Very, very good. And then there's an interview with a woman called Carol Bowman, or Bowman, 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 thank you, on children's uh, memories of past lives. And then there's a seminar on that. And then Maitra Bandhu has also done um, sessions at the LBC, sort of about half an hour talks, recapping that territory. So there's, there's actually a lot that you can catch up on uh, particularly about about death so I'd really encourage you all to watch those um, what I took away from all those is it's all quite convincing you know when you when you really listen to these people who have researched these things well it seems more convincing and not convincing that something continues the near-death experiences are very convincing um, I mean, there's one, there's one that I, I tried, I tried to find the source. I heard this years ago and I Googled it and I couldn't find it. So it may actually not even be true, but it, I, when I heard it, I was so amazed. And this is, um, let's see if I can get the story right. There was a person in a house and someone came and knocked on the door and said, I really wanted to thank you for, um, attending to me in that awful car crash some time ago. Yeah. And this person said, wow, how, how, what, what happened? And how did you know? And this person said, well, I was in this car crash and, uh, I had, uh, it was a near death experience. I was out of my body and I saw you come and help. And I saw your number plate <laughs> and that when I recovered, I tracked you down through the number plate and here I am to say, thank you. I mean, I've gone goosebumpy <laughs> just hearing that. I think that is a true story. Have you have you heard it, Yana Bacha? Something, so. Something similar, yeah. And then there's another book called After by Bruce Grayson, Bruce. and he's got a, a very interesting uh, story right at the beginning of the book about um, a person who has a near death experience, and the doctor has ketchup on his tie, um, and he covered her over when he went into the room, but before he come in to treat her, he had his white coat open and he had ketchup on his tie and she she knew that he had ketchup on his tie because she'd her consciences had left the body 
So it's very hard to dispute these things because they're, you can't imagine them, you know, because there's this kind of factual details to them. So I do find it all very convincing and it does really align with uh, what Buddhism teaches. Um, so really tonight I'm going to be more going into the, the Buddhist side of things. I'll just say a couple of things personally that um, my grandmother died when I was, I think, about 23 and I'd never seen a dead person uh, till then. I'd seen dead animals because we had lots of pets and there's an amazing cycle of birth and death when you've got pets that you kind of breed your guinea pigs and you see a lot of birth and a lot of death. So I'd seen that, but I'd never seen a dead body. And uh, she was at home and me and my, my sister were there with my father. And I looked at her, I was crying, and I looked at her and I thought, what made you nanny? What made you nanny? Because this body wasn't her. And I thought, ah, oh, it was the light in your eyes. It was the light in your eyes that made you nanny. So then the question is, what, what's the light in our eyes? And that's a big part of why I'm here. That started a quest. You know, what's, what's the light in our eyes? I mean, if I just look around, I can sort of, it's amazing, isn't it? That we're not just these kind of inert objects. There is something that is flowing through us and expressing it as the light in our eyes. So yeah, I'm still very interested. What's the light in our eyes? But uh, that was very striking that that's what made Nanny Nanny. It wasn't her physical form. And also in fourth form physics, which is very, very basic physics, um, I was about 14. And we learned that energy never stops, it just changes. And that was like, wow, that energy never, never, I'm looking at the physicist over there. <laughs> and there, I hope that, is that correct? That energy never stops, good. And so I thought, um, <laughs> That means that something in me never ends or the energy that I'm experiencing doesn't just stop. It can't just stop at death. So of course you can argue, well, it turns into you know, the energy of earthworms. And so there's lots of ways you can kind of rationalize that away from the continuity of consciousness. But it was a very, it was one of those moments again, you know, in the lab as a 14 year old learning that energy never stops. That means that this experience of being alive some, somehow something was going to continue as energy. And um, as part of preparing for this talk, I got in touch with an old friend of mine in New Zealand, a, a doctor called Case Lodder, Dutch doctor that lives in New Zealand, who's a palliative care doctor and so does a lot of end of life care. And very interesting, he's also um, now quite involved with assisted dying, which is now legal in New Zealand as of I think a year ago there's a referendum so you can now have assisted dying so they have a, a you have a main doctor and then you have an independent assessor and he's an independent assessor because he's all as you can imagine there's all kinds of um, very very strict criteria to be able to have assisted dying but really really interesting so he's very he's very involved in death seen loads of people dying and one of the things he said to me was oh I'm really looking forward to dying I found that amazing and it wasn't from any kind of I hate life attitude it was more I'm looking forward to the adventure and a great confidence that something amazing happens at death this is from a, a doctor who's seen many many people die in a palliative care situation and he said he always asked people, what do you think happens when we die? He always asked them that. He's a lovely guy and he's a Buddhist. He's a, he's a Buddhist in um, Thich Nhat Hanh tradition. And he's, so, he, so he believes in continuity. He always says, what, what do you believe happens? And he said that people, including those who are non-religious, almost invariably come up with some kind of spiritual construct. Very interesting, isn't it? They, they found a way of making sense of it for themselves. And when he obviously talks very sort of deeply with them and he says almost everybody has had some kind of um, sort of inexplicable situation in life 
Like we will all have, if we really sort of reflect, we will all have had some kind of experience in life that is pointing to the fact that this isn't everything. And so he really draws that out with people. But I thought that was also very interesting that people are nearing death and he helps them kind of free up their minds by remembering times when there's been some kind of opening in their life. Um, and he says he loves the conversations. It really enhances belief that something continues. One of the things that's very beautiful is he, he says he gets people to put in, in the room, take away all the pictures of their living relatives and put pictures of their relatives or their loved ones who have died. So I thought that was interesting, you know, to the, 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 the people who have already gone before have surround yourself with that rather than your loved ones who, you know, there's a lot of evidence that, that people die often when the loved ones leave the room because there isn't that pull holding you back. So he gets them to place these, these photos of their beloved relatives. And then he asks people to practice gently letting go. So they're lying there in hospital and they're rehearsing this gently letting go. So I imagine particularly with the assisted dying, because of course you know when it's gonna happen. So you can be doing this kind of rehearsal of how to die. Um, And he, and he said that not all deaths are easy, of course. You know, it's quite, we can sort of romanticise it as if we're all going to have a lovely death. And of course, we don't know what kind of death we're going to have. <clears throat> I mean, he talked about one Catholic nun who had a complete crisis of faith just before she died. And he said it was terrible, terrible for her. Like every, didn't believe in God anymore. Suddenly everything fell away. So she had a difficult death. So, you know, that's, that was interesting. Um, so moving on to this, this, in a way, thinking about death, it inevitably brought me to life. You know, the mystery of death is the mystery of life. And the, we have this question, is there life after death? You know, that's a question many of us would articulate. So I think an even more remarkable question is, is there life before death? Like, are we really, really alive? now or are we just kind of existing until we die you know that's that's a very juicy question is there life before death and uh, <clears throat> i had an experience in when i was 25 when um i've got the spinal injury i'd had i'd had it a while but i had a big crisis and i was in intensive care very very sick lots of things happened but uh, one of the sort of strong experiences I had then was, um, I was I was in the ward, it was in Auckland, and it was a high-rise kind of hospital, and I was looking out over the city. And the city became very kind of misty. It was very interesting. And it was like um, everything became very thin. It's the only way I can describe it, that... Everything that seemed very hard edged became very sort of thin and a bit insubstantial and misty. And I really felt that I had a choice, that I could have let go. And it was quite, it was quite appealing, this kind of just drift off. I mean, I, I don't know whether I was near death. I don't, I don't think physiologically I was, but something was something very very um strong was happening where my hold on life was loosening and i thought i had a choice and i chose life yeah again, again it wasn't massively conscious but there was definitely this point and i thought no i'm i'm not ready i haven't lived this life yet and i chose life and since then my life actually has felt qualitatively different since I actively chose life, it's like I'm here because I've chosen it rather than I'm just kind of filling in time until I die. And if I think about how I felt prior to that point, I think I was just kind of existing. So that I really want to put that out into the room, you know, kind of, are you choosing this full-blooded 
kind of astonishing experience we call life, or are you just kind of living in some kind of half life? So I think I think we all I think we all do need to choose life moment by moment. I think we all have a choice moment by moment. So in Buddhism, it's very traditional that um, one of the kind of purposes of life is to really train our awareness, to train our hearts so that we're able to, when, when, when death comes along, we're able to free ourselves from the, the confines of the body and we're able to um, uh, experience some big mind, non-dual awareness, there's lots and lots of different names for it, the absolute, the unconditioned, um, but some quality that's completely and utterly free. That's, that's very traditional in Buddhism. Um, so I was thinking about this, that maybe we need to peel ourselves back from worrying about death and really just try to be alive right now and really try to take responsibility for our quality of consciousness right now. Because I think worrying about death can actually kind of be another ego project. Am I going to continue? I want to continue. So we're kind of worrying about death because we're worrying about me. And, you know, we don't like the idea of not continuing, of course, because that's very frightening. Um, but Buddhism is also saying <clears throat> that this attachment to a kind of fixed autonomous identity is also delusional and it's the cause of our suffering and that there's something much more that we're a kind of flow of experience that you know it's in this form but you know i'm not kind of some rigid static hard little lump i'm i'm quite porous you're quite porous and we're kind of co-creating our experience of life all the time um so even this thing of, am I going to continue? And I hope there's life after death so that I can continue. Buddhism would say that that's just based on deep delusion because actually you don't even live like that right now. You don't even exist like that right now. So forget about death. It's more like, how can we profoundly change our relationship with our experience right now? Um, and Buddhism's got this teaching of the bardos, uh, particularly later Buddhism. And bardo means intermediate state. And traditionally, there's six bardos. There's the bardo of this life. So that's, that's a kind of intermediate state between a previous life and a future life. Uh, there's the bardo of meditation. So every time we meditate, we're entering a, a kind of intermediate state between how we were before meditation and then we come out of the meditation and something's changed. So this flow that I'm labeling Vidyamala is taking some other kind of expression after the bardo of meditation. There's the bardo of sleep and dreams. Yeah. And I, I find that one really, really interesting because, you know, we, we, we go to bed, put our head on the pillow. We think we're this kind of stable, fixed being. And then we have this amazing experience at night. We've, we can fly, we can make things up, you know, we, we create this whole universe in our sleep and somehow we think, well, that's not really real, but this is, you know, maybe that is as real as this, you know, and then we wake up in the morning and we kind of more, more or less look the same. And so we think, well, me as a fixed person has just had this kind of little fantasy and here I am back as this fixed person. But when you really start to unpack that, it's so amazing that we're never exactly the same after a dream. And that dream, the dream world seems so real, doesn't it? So real. And in, in, in Buddhism, you know, there's training around dream yoga, lucid dreaming, all these kind of things, so that you're even training your consciousness at night if you're very, if you're very adept. There's lots of uh, practices around that. And then it's about of dying. So that's another intermediate state, you know, you're alive and then you're not alive. So that's an intermediate state. And that's seen as this, this massive opportunity because you get this bright light of luminosity. And this, this comes out in all the near death experiences where people see this light 
again, that maps directly onto the, the Bardo teachings that were taught, you know, I don't know, 8th century, 9th century in India and Tibet, this idea of luminosity. Um, then there's a Bardo of what's called the Dharmata, which is a kind of dreamlike state. So you, have, you haven't been able to sort of meet the light, so you kind of fall into this dreamlike state, probably a bit like our normal dreams, perhaps. And then there's the bardo of um, rebecoming and rebirth. So you kind of fall. You, some, sometimes I say you faint, and then you find yourself in a new life. And then, of course, we can't remember any of that. So that's the traditional um, teaching on the bardos. And uh, I was on a retreat here a few months ago that was really amazing, actually. So there's a book called The Bardo to Dole, which I think translates as liberation through hearing. Yes, good, thank you. God, it's so good having Yana Vach here because he just nods. <laughs> I'm sure he'd go like this if I got it wrong. <laughs> so it's a liberation through hearing. So again, traditionally in these cultures and in Tibet in particular, if someone's dying, somebody would be whispering these teachings into their ear. And now this is going to happen. And now this is going to happen. And now you're going to have a bright light and you're going to have a smoky light. Go for the bright light. Oh, you missed the bright light. Okay, next. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you've missed the bright light, then this is going to happen. And then there's a deity. Oh, go for the deity. Oh, you missed that as well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the liberation to hearing for you. And I think the hearing sense is the last sense to go when you're dying. Anyway, so we had this retreat. It was amazing. So um, we spent the morning reading it out loud. And it's quite long. So this was hours of just hearing these Dharma texts. And we completely blacked this room out. So all the windows were covered in blankets. We had a shrine in the middle. There were skeletons hanging by the door. So you had to enter through skeletons. And um, it was very immersive. <laughs> <laughs> Got quite smelly after a few days. <laughs> sort of bodies and no ventilation. Um, and uh, I lay at the back and I lay down and I put a blanket over my head and I just let these words in. It was really very, very powerful. So again, you know, there, we see a direct mapping of these Bardo teachings and the near-death experiences. And actually, uh, in terms of the near-death case, my, my doctor friend, he says he calls them death experiences. He doesn't call them near-death because a lot of people have actually died. It's not that they nearly died, you've actually died and then you're brought back to life if, you're, if your heart stops. So I thought that was very interesting. He calls them death experiences. And that, you know, I found that interesting because the skeptical part of me thinks, well, we don't really know because we've only got these messages from people who have nearly died and we don't know what happens after that. So when he said that they, they have actually died, I thought, well, okay, that's a bit more convincing. <laughs> Because you, know, you sort of think, well, maybe something really horrible happens after. You know, if you don't come back, then something really awful happens. You just don't know, do you? But anyway. Um, okay, so <clears throat> so this ties in very much with what Vajrashura was talking about last night of endless rebecoming, like moment by moment by moment by moment. We're, we're having a little death and a little rebirth. And that's, again, very traditional, that we're, 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 we're continually letting go of Ideally, we continue letting go of this experience and then receiving the next experience, letting go, receiving, letting go, receiving, with agency, of course. That's the thing that we have in this life is this agency of our conscious mind where we can guide our stream towards liberation rather than contraction, which is what you were talking about with the, um, with the karma and with actions having consequences. So... Um, I think one way of looking at all this is that we can see our life, perhaps one of, the, one of the purposes of our lives, there's many purposes, I think, but one of the purposes is to see it as training our heart mind. And the Tibetans call it the mind stream, which I really love, actually, because even the mind can sound like a, a thing, but the mind stream, the mind, heart mind stream, we're training that away from habits of rigidifying around experience to releasing and opening. That, that's increasingly how I understand it. So the gesture would be moving from this to this. That's the sort of gesture of practice. And we rigidify 
very, very automatically. So we have a sense impression, something unpleasant, and we immediately go, ugh, don't like it. We have a sense impression, something pleasant, and we go, oh, I want more. And that kind of pushing away and pulling in, those are the primary drivers around this reinforcing of this sort of fixed human being that's bumping up against our experience and having unsatisfactoriness, which is what the Buddha said is, is the first noble truth, un unsatisfactoriness. We're kind of bumping along because we keep on rigidifying around experience. And we can open to something greater. I thought the way Maitreya Bandhu introduced the puja last night was beautiful, you know, that, we, that all the time there is something else, something higher, something deeper, something broader. There's another way of being, another kind of consciousness that's available all the time. But we're crushing it, we sort of crush, crush it, crush against it with this becoming tight and narrow so we can't see it anymore. Um, and we can't experience it anymore. So that all sounds very well and good. You know, we're just sort of going along and we're letting go and we're releasing, we're letting go and releasing. And that's the training. But I just want to say a little bit about well, what actually happens because life is just really hard sometimes for, I think probably for all of us. You know, sometimes this process of being alive and the process of thinking, oh my God, I've got to be responsible for my own consciousness. That's very, very daunting. Um, you know, sometimes life is unbearable for us, isn't it? And, uh, you know, I've had a lot of suffering myself in my life. So unfortunately, I, I seem to have become the suffering expert. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, I think it probably is quite funny in a certain kind of way. <laughs> but, um, it wasn't exactly the strap line I was wanting when I was a teenager. <laughs> but, you know, that, that, that I'm not, I'm no stranger to suffering. So I've sort of found ways of navigating it. So I just thought I'd share a few of those because I, I know we all have dark times. Um, I mean, one of them is Paul Gilbert, who um, my tribe Andrew interviewed for the project, who's developed compassion focused therapy. Very, very, very interesting guy. A compassionate guy and one of the things he draws out is is the effect of evolution on our kind of nervous systems and our brains and he often says and talks it's chaotic in there <laughs> you know he says we've got any and he says we've got very very tricky brains that evolution has gifted us a very sort of threat-based brain very alert for anything that's going to eat us or threaten us in some kind of way and uh, it used to be things like saber-toothed tigers we don't have those anymore and some of the uh, the researchers say that we're very oriented now towards social threat and of course social threat is there all the time you know do they like me um social media of course really feeds this we've probably all got it here to some extent you know somebody doesn't smile at you you think oh no they don't like me what have i done wrong particularly in the silence we can really get into that kind of thing um, so we're surrounded by what we can perceive as threat. And then we have all kinds of automatic reactions. We get certain chemicals, we go into sort of fight and flight mode, hypervigilance, all these kinds of things. So the great thing that he says is it's not your fault. And that can be a massive relief for people. So if you are feeling all kind of, oh, they don't like me, I'm feeling paranoid and insecure and, um, yeah, paranoid and insecure, they're quite familiar for a lot of us, aren't they? Anxious. And then, you know, we're here on a retreat and we're hearing a lot about positive mental states and you think, well, I should be positive. I'm here on this retreat and here I am, paranoid and insecure and anxious. Shouldn't be here, I'm a bad Buddhist, doing it all wrong, I'm a failure. Well, just remember Paul Gilbert saying, it's not your fault. It's just the way you're wired up. And then he says, but it is your responsibility. I find that so good. It's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. Because every moment we have an opportunity to meet that with kindness, meet that with empathy, know that it's normal rather than you're some kind of freak because you're depressed and anxious. It's normal. It's what human brains do sometimes. And then how can you meet that with kindness and then 
uh, respond more creatively, which is what we've heard about today and last night. So that's the first thing. And then I think the next thing that I would recommend is to chunk it down to moments when things look really bleak and you're projecting into the future, thinking, oh my God, it's just going to go on forever and it's awful and there's no point. Just that, that's all mind created. Your mind is telling that whole story. All you know is now. So chunk it down to moments. And one of my um, sort of insights is the present moment is always bearable. Yeah, I think, I think the present moment is, I mean, some people have challenged me on this, but almost always the present moment is bearable. Whereas that whole story isn't, but the present moment is bearable. And then you, you sort of really start to drop into that, investigate that, this mystery of the present moment, and you realize it's not just that bleak experience, but there's other experiences as well. There's pleasure. So you open yourself up to what's pleasant right now. Yeah. I mean, I've got back pain right now. Um, butterflies, a little bit of insecurity, a little bit of anxiety. And also I've got, oh, look, there's so much Matty smiling. <laughs> Nana Varcha keeps on affirming my Dharma points, which is brilliant. <laughs> You're all out there. I can see the light in your eyes. I mean, that is just completely beautiful. So the present moment starts to become a bit more multidimensional. When you peel yourself off this kind of awfulizing about everything, drop back into what's actually happening and then find the different flavors, find the different flavors. And there's always a whole variety and we can also make choices. You might think I'm going to go and stand at the window and look at the blue sky. That's a, that's a positive creative choice. I'm going to phone a friend. I'm going to eat something, <laughs> you know, whatever it might be. Um, there's always, there's always a choice point. But we can only find those choice points if we're willing to be present. And uh, another nice little saying is every moment is a new chance. Every moment is a new chance. So if you feel totally blown in this moment, which we will do, and then we can think, oh, I've completely blown it. We think, oh, no, I've got another opportunity right now. And here's another one. And here's another one. So just keep on seizing the opportunities, no matter how far down into the slough of despond. I really love that expression, sloth of despond. You've gone, there's always some, you can always find some kind of ladder out just by one tiny little micro choice. Um, and then, this is really totally exciting and mysterious. <laughs> it's a, when you really get curious about being alive right now, and the, this being here because when you think about the present moment it sounds like a tiny little speck doesn't it like a little pinprick and you think that doesn't sound very spacious but what really happens is that this this sense of presence kind of explodes and becomes it can become very multi-dimensional and it can contain um or well, it's like the mind changes from being tight and narrow to being this other quality of mind, which is very open and loving. I mean, I had a tiny little taste of, it, taste of it just before when I was saying, well, I've got my back pain and a few butterflies, a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of insecurity. And then when I th thought the light in your eyes, something really shifted in my awareness. It became really big rather than just sort of me and my discomfort. It became all of us. And then I think you can you can extrapolate that to nth degree where you're just open to something that's completely boundless and completely luminous, which is, again, what the Buddha teaches. But the doorway is here, I think. I think the doorway is here. That's why I don't think the doorway is thinking about when, when I might die, because that will arrive as a moment. So we practice it now, we practice it now, we find that doorway, the light, like I talked about the doorway in the sky the other day, you find that right here. And it, it's always available. It's always available. It might be a tiny little crack, or it might just swing wide open in a practice. 
So I think awe is a very beautiful word. A-W-E. I love the word awe. That we should be willing to be awed by just the kind of complete mystery of awareness and life when we're willing to just be with what is. And in, on this retreat that I was on, on the, on the, on the Bardo to Dole, Sabuti gave talks every afternoon. Sabuti is a very senior teacher in our tradition. And he was saying, and I thought this was really brilliant, that every single moment there's a flash of pure awareness. And pure awareness is this kind of unbound consciousness, unbound quality of awareness. And every single moment it's flashing. But normally we're crushing it with our craving and our aversion, our sort of habits. So that's very exciting as well, isn't it? That for the rest of the retreat, you can see if you can just have, have a glimpse of this, this flash flash of luminosity every single moment. Um, so, um, you know, what is that? And what does the Buddha say about this mind, this quality of mind that is not just stuck in the senses and not just stuck in this kind of tight way of being? And Buddhism has got a lot to say about that. I mean, it's, it's, it's all metaphorical. It's very clear that it's beyond words. So, you know, I can't tell you this is what the enlightened mind is like. It's, it's, it seems to be um, outside our normal reference points of, of, of language and time and space. But we have images. So there's the blue sky. That's very traditional that the this, mind, this, this consciousness that is not bound to just this life. Um, one of the images is the clear blue sky. And we, we are being fortunate to have some blue skies this week. So something you could do is go out, lie on your back in the field and sky gaze. That's a beautiful practice, just sky gaze and allow your consciousness, your awareness just to kind of be like the sky sky gaze. Um, in one of the traditions of, of Buddhism called Dzogchen, they've got a nice way of describing it, where they say that the, the, the mind that's free is open, there's openness, there's clear knowing and there's sensitivity. So again, those are beautiful words, aren't they? Openness, clearly knowing and sensitivity. And they've got images. So openness is the essence of mind. And that's like the clear blue sky. So the essence of kind of who we are is like the clear blue sky and it's open, openness. And then clear knowing is the nature of mind, according to this tradition. And that's the sun, that's the sun that lights up the sky. So you've got the sky and then the sun lights up the sky. And then the sensitive heart quality is the energy of the mind. And that's like the rays of the sun that pervade everywhere. So you've got the blue sky, you've got the sun, and then you've got the rays of the sun. So I find that very beautiful. So these three qualities of the, of the sort of awakened mind is openness, clearly knowing and sensitive. That's just within one particular tradition. Uh, it seems to be vast. I, I, I like the word vast. That word sort of speaks to me, you know, that kind of very evocative sort of quality of opening. Um, and luminosity, have I said luminosity already? I really, really love the word luminosity. And a, a sort of metaphor that really works for me is that we are all right now condensations of the radiant nature of awareness. That's what we are. You know, we think we're these little lumps. <laughs> but another way is we're all condensations of the radiant nature of reality, the radiant nature of awareness. We're expressing it in our own unique ways, but it's something flowing through us. And Sangharachita Bhante, he, he, one of the things he said in a, in a seminar is that we're all coagulations of the common stream of life. We're coagulations of the common stream of life. I've reflected on that very deeply. It's, it's, it's unesthetic, 
And I think it's incredibly accurate. So there's a common stream of life that we're all expressing. And then we sort of clot our habits, our views, this kind of craving and aversion, this holding on to things is like this kind of clotting, coagulating. And then sometimes we get really crusty and scabby. You know, like, like if you get a, a, a blood, you get a graze and it's flowing blood and then it gets sticky and then it gets kind of a bit hard and then it gets really crusty. So some of us get really, really crusty. <laughs> I, think it's a, I think it's a brilliant metaphor and, and sort of scabby. But that can be, you know, it can be turned back into water. You know, with different conditions, blood can flow again. And uh, I think another, another sort of image that we do is we snag. You know when you get a fingernail on wool and it catches and you pull, you pull the thread and, and you suddenly you've got, you had, a ni- you had a really nice jumper and suddenly it's got this great big sort of thread hanging out. And I think we kind of snag against life. I know I snag against life. It's like I stick to things and then I sort of pull I make a little hole in the fabric of life, if you like. So I think, I think snagging is a really good word. So we, we need to learn not to snag. And that means not to get sort of sticky against things, but just to let, let this kind of life flow through us. And um, the last thing to say that's very, very important is it's, it's very obvious in Buddhism, and it seems to come out in the near-death experiences, that love is an absolutely... Um, intrinsic part of this awareness. So it's not a kind of cool, aloof, abstract awareness, but it's utterly saturated and drenched in love. So what's, what's that like? Yeah. So we can all open ourselves to that. It seems that it's not that you have awareness and then love's a kind of add-on, but that love is an essential part of that experience that um, when when people have these near-death experiences, they often have experiences of unconditional love, that there's the light, but there's also this unconditional love. And somehow we're closing ourselves down against that all the time with our habits and our snagging and our clotting and our snagging and scabbing. (laughs) And that it's here all the time. And again, Bante's got, he says in another lecture, I think this is really great as well, that there's two different ways of looking at this journey of training our awareness so we can be more open to this this free quality. And he says one metaphor is climbing a mountain. So, you know, sometimes it can really feel like hard work and we have to put in that effort. Like here, we're putting in the effort to turn up, sit on the cushions, even if we're uncomfortable and, you know, face our experience, I suppose. So there is that quality of effort. And then the other metaphor is the lotus a lotus unfolding and you discover what was there all along. And he talks about in in some of the Chinese and Japanese traditions, you get these monks who attain liberation and they just laugh. They laugh their heads off and they're laughing. They say, oh my God, it was there all along. It was there all along. And it's just absolutely hilarious to them that you know they think it's the it's, it's going somewhere else for something else and it's right here so it's a bit like you know the eye can't we can't see our own eye it's so close to us that we can't see it or well, sometimes it's like a fish swimming in water the fish doesn't know it's in water so that's i find that very optimistic you know it's climbing the mountain because we need to put effort in but it's also I mean, maybe it's a bit like the activity and receptivity that that we can be like the great monks just laughing our heads off when we Sort of, it's a bit like we've got the wrong spectacles on. And we just take the glasses off and we think, oh my God, you know, you're all conden- condensations of the radiant nature of awareness. How amazing that. <laughs> and you always were and you always will be. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to finish um, reading a little bit. Um, this is an amazing book called In Love with the World by a Tibetan monk called Yonge Ringyur Rinpoche. And it says, what a Buddhist monk can teach you about living from nearly dying. 
what a Buddhist monk can teach you about living from nearly dying. So very, very briefly, he's a, he was a very, he's very, very um, sort of high ranking Lama, a bit like royalty, I think. And he decides to effectively climb over the monastery wall and escape because he really wants to get out of that and to just be a nobody. And he becomes a beggar, he gives a, takes off his robes. I think it's a bit like Prince William leaving the royal family here. <laughs> I mean, it is a really rem absolutely remarkable thing that he did. And he wants to go on this wandering retreat for years and really quite soon he gets food poisoning. So he has quite a lot of humiliations. And one of them is actually when he's begging, he's, his whole system has been used to very, you know, royal food and suddenly he's having leftovers from a street restaurant and he gets very very bad dysentery and food poisoning and does really does nearly die because he's trained he's able to track the whole process with tremendous awareness so i'm just going to read you some of what he experienced it's very very inspiring very very encouraging he doesn't die obviously um but he's brought he, he's like a messenger from the beyond bringing us the buddhist perspective on this so i'll just read this there's a couple of passages this is when he's realizing that he's probably dying my body is deteriorating i have no money no gold coins no things of value even so I have the possibility of waking up, of realizing the deepest, most subtle aspects of consciousness. My precious human birth is my treasure in health and in sickness, for it never betrays the possibility of awakening. How could any treasure be worth more than knowing that? How fortunate I am, how truly blessed. My only offering now is how I manifest this Dharma treasure, how I manifest living, how I manifest dying, how I live this moment, this only moment. And then he starts going through the whole dissolution of the elements with amazing awareness. So his body gets very, very, very heavy. Then he gets very dry. Then he gets very cold. And then the air element begins to dissipate and then suddenly boom the entire universe opened up and became totally unified with consciousness no conceptual mind i was no longer within the universe the universe was within me no me separate from the universe no direction no within or without no perception or non-perception, no self or non-self, no living, no dying. The internal movements of the organs and senses slowed way down to minimal functioning. I still understood what was going on, but not through commentary or voice or image. That type of cognition no longer presented itself. The clarity and luminosity of awareness beyond concepts, beyond fixed mind, became the sole vehicle of knowing. I was no longer bonded to any sense of a distinct body or mind. No separation existed between me, my mind, my skin, my body, and the entire rest of the world. No phenomenon existed separate from me. Experiences happened, but no longer to a separate me. Perceptions occurred, but with no reference back to anyone. No references at all. No memory. Perceptions, but no perceiver. The me that I had recently been, sick, healthy, beggar, Buddhist, disappeared like clouds that move through a sunlit sky. As a drop of water placed in the ocean becomes indistinct, boundless, unrecognizable, and yet still exists, so my mind merged with space. That's a very traditional image of the drop of water 
merging with the ocean. It was no longer a matter of me seeing trees, as I had become trees. Me and trees were one. Trees were not the object of awareness, they manifested awareness. Stars were not the object of appreciation, but appreciation itself. No separate me loved the world. The world was love. Oh my God, I'm going to cry. <laughs> my perfect home, vast and intimate. Every particle was alive with love, fluid, flowing, without barriers. I was an alive particle. No interpretive mind, clarity beyond ideas. Vibrant, energetic, all seeing. My awareness did not go toward anything, yet everything appeared. As an empty mirror both receives and reflects everything around it. A flower appears in the empty mirror of the mind and the mind accepts its presence without inviting or rejecting. It seemed as if I could see forever, as if I could see through trees, as if I could be trees. I cannot even say I continued to breathe or my heart continued to beat. There was no individual anything, no dualistic perception, no body, no mind, only consciousness. 